right. Well, welcome everyone to the Fringe Coffee Coffee Dialogue. Uh, my name is Benjamin Myers. I'm the Growers Program Manager with Fringe Coffee. And uh, today we have two wonderful guests for our uh, Coffee Dialogue episode number 10. So we do this once a month on the third Thursday of each month from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. And this uh, is a recorded um, dialogue, so it'll be available on our YouTube channel uh, later today. And today's topic is on ecological intensification. And we have uh, Felipe Croci from Fazenda Ambiental Fortaleza in Brazil presenting first. And then following uh, Felipe, we have Marta Metvenko from Fringe Coffee, and she's uh, the R&D uh, manager of, at our Davis site. And just a quick little note about our next uh, Coffee Dialogue, episode 11, will be regarding specialty coffee in California. So kind of a historical narrative of, you know, some of the beginnings of specialty coffee, how we got to where we are. And we have two great guests for that. We have uh, Rick Reinhardt, the strategy director of Agri Commodities at IDH and the Sustainable Trade Initiative. And he's also the uh, former uh, longtime CEO of the Specialty Coffee Association. And then our other speaker will be James Freeman, who's the founder of Blue Bottle Coffee and uh, actually has some uh, fringe coffee plants on, on his farm right now too. So he's a small time coffee grower, just, just got a handful. So that's exciting. And I, I might try to add a couple of other uh, speakers as well to that, but that's gonna be July uh, 15th from one to 3 p.m. Um, so again, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have the presentations and then we're going to have questions and answers. So if you have questions that come up during uh, one of the presentations, feel free to stick them in the chat and we can get to them at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Felipe to go. All right. Um... Hi, Ben, and hi, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be connected with you guys. Um, my name is Felipe Croci. I'm a coffee farmer and exporter out of the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, I'm, uh, we have a farm, and we have a, a company called Faf Coffees, and we um, work with smallholder farms in four regions of Brazil. We help develop uh, the quality and sustainability in the communities as a whole. And um, um, we've been around, our company has been around since 2009. Um, my parents have been running our farm since 2001 um, as an organic coffee farm. And um, the farm has been in the family for five generations. So um, I was born into a coffee family. Although I grew up in the US, in Chicago, um, studied liberal arts and um, came back in 2009, once I finished college and came into the farm um, after having worked at a, especially coffee roastery and a little bit at shops. So I came into coffee very much as a um, person that viewed coffee as a beverage, as a something that was delicious and that was that came out of a cup. And I found a very traditional coffee growing community. Um, you know, uh, down the road from us, 20 minutes down is the biggest cooperative in the world called Koshupe. And they process about 6 million bags a year uh, in, in uh, those facilities. And um, at the time coffee was struggling uh, going through several over a decade of low prices and a lot of people ripping out coffee um, in order to uh, either uh, grow cat to raise cattle or uh, rent out to sugarcane mills. Um, and um, I found that 
not many people associated coffee the way I did as a beverage. Um, so I wanted to share with you guys um, after having talked to Ben um, with the young and uh, flourishing coffee community in California, uh, kind of a overview of how I would start a coffee field today, um, and particularly with experiences on my farm. So um, share my screen. And, and um, so, you know, this term regenerative, it's kind of uh, wet being well spread around quite a bit. But uh, overall at FAF, we've been trying to be as ecological and sustainable um, as possible while producing high quality and efficient farming. So uh, let's say that I want to grow coffee in, in an ecological way. So what would I, what can I do? And so I, I put together a step-by-step -step of kind of a practical way of looking at it. Um, and um, I'm going to walk you through it, how I kind of look at it. Now, I'm not a trained agronomist. I have a team, a great team that supports me, um, agronomists that work with me, um, but um, more of a uh, the one who's managing and leading the sort of decisions. So um, understanding uh, where you are, understanding your terroir and um, knowing the soil that you have, uh, if how you can better uh, prepare that soil, prepare a home for the coffee, um, deciding what to plant, planning how to plant the spacings and more and, and uh, what more, um, how to be able to feed that plant enough, uh, especially if you're gonna be organic, how to handle um, different types of diseases and pests um, that, that could, uh, could come to um, plague your coffee. And um, of course, the most important of all team, so um, the first thing that um, I would say is that understanding your terroir or, uh, you know, technically I know terroir is, is made up of combination of uh, um, a play, a climate and, and um, what, what, the, what we do as, as uh, the farmers. But let's say that understanding your climate. So the relationship between rain and temperature, uh, when the rain uh, happened, what the rainy season is like, what is the dry, dry season like, what are the temperature uh, peaks um, in your uh, climate and is that changing over time? Um, so what kind of relationship does that have with the decisions that you will make? When will you plant and whatnot? Um, so in um, my region, which is called the Mojiana, region of uh, Sao Paulo, it's in the southeast of Brazil, we have a fairly uh, predictable um, season where uh, traditionally we have a rainy season and a dry season. So uh, the rains, they start around October and they rain through March. Um, and then from April to September, we have a dry season. And uh, that's becoming more intensified. Um, we're having less and less rain and now we're starting to see some dry spells in January in the middle of summer um, and some higher peaks of temperature in January. So um, I'll go into how we're handling those issues. Um, so what kind of soil do you have? And what's the composition of that soil? Um, you can take a, a, a soil analysis, both physical and chemical uh, soil analysis. Um, so, you know, what's the, the um, balance of the nutrients and as well as uh, the physical composition between, you know, um, clay, um, different um, um, sand and silt and whatnot. So uh, in general, it's important to keep that organic matter high and to give a sort of balanced um, system. So this is where I'm located and uh, that's the map of Brazil. And at the bottom, at the left side, you see um, the, the red circle is the city of Sao Paulo. Um, and the little white circle above that is Mojiana region where FAF or Fazenda Mental Fortaleza is located uh, where I am right now. So it's on the border of the state of Sao Paulo and Minas. 
And traditionally, borders were made uh, by some kind of environmental uh, geographic uh, landmark. So in this case, the mountains are right on the border of Sao Paulo and uh, Minas. And um, at the right side, you'll see my farm, Fazenda Mental Fortaleza, um, and surrounding area. So that's uh, um, in red, those are micro basins or eco basins. So um, it actually covers a little more than my farm, but what we try to consider as a living ecosystem. So um, trying to think of, of uh, a piece of land as something that's alive and understanding where the water cycles, where the water, where are all the springs, um, how do they flow through different properties as sort of life blains, life uh, blood veins of the, of, the, of the land and how can we preserve that and pass that on to neighbors um, as clean as they uh, were, as they originated as a lot of coffee farms are high in mountains and where a lot of springs are located. So we've located about 36 springs on the farm and we've been protecting them and uh, also uh, talking with our neighbors about um, creating uh, sanitation um, systems, water filtration systems after the patio or after the houses and uh, to keep that and pass that on. Um, so our landscape is um, uh, rolling hills. Um, and so there are places that are more steep, but um, we are fairly able to mechanize quite a bit of the farm. Um, and so this is kind of a landscape picture and you can see that um, there are, um, I, I, we've kind of split the farm between, uh, I run the coffee and my mom runs um, cattle and uh, milk, organic milk. Um, so there's different um, pockets of forest, of pastures and of coffee um, going on. Um, so step two, um, so what kind of soil do I have? And um, again, uh, having a, a chemical uh, analysis and um, in acting on that um, before you uh, start to, to, to plant. So um, I think it's smart to, to correct and make any corrections if that's necessary, some limestone, or if you need to correct the pH and find a balance um, and um, understand the physical components of that. So um, what, what kind of uh, soil do you have? Uh, nowadays, I am a more pragmatic organic farmer um, than, than um, I would say, uh, I have different views from some of my neighbors and from how my mother grows, used to grow. Um, so I prefer to prepare the, the land before I plant, even if that means that I use um, some kind of chemical um, um, correction in the soil. Um, and um, always trying to use as organic ways as possible. But um, so I'll go back into that in a little bit. And um, soil compaction and terraces. So how, how is my soil? Is it, is it dry? Is it compacted? Um, do I need to uh, uh, make any kind of terracing um, so that I can work? And, and of course that takes into consideration whether you're gonna mechanize, semi-mechanize, or if it's all gonna be um, um, hand labor. So a good soil is going to uh, allow for the root system to go much deeper. It's going to uh, aerate much more. It's going to be pockets to hold microorganisms and, and water and, and all kinds of things um, that will um, allow for biomass and more, might more life in the soil, which will bring more balance. Um, the able to harbor more water, which will have the plant, uh, help the plant grow and also be able to weather um, dry spells um, and, and, and um, uh, especially as, as those are becoming more frequent with um, global warming. So on the right, you see a plant that is, uh, does not have the same depth of root structure um, it, to, to support its growth. And um, <clears throat> so on the left here, you have a, uh, Di, uh, I think it's called a daikon or, or a turnip. It's a 
Nabu for Hajero, it's a cover crop, um, which we plant. Uh, that this is a small, this is a baby one. It's uh, still growing, but basically it um, will fix quite a lot of nutrients. Um, oh, sorry about that. Will fix quite a lot of nutrients in the soil, um, such as nitrogen and, and more things, but more particularly, it will open um, holes. It will, it will help to make the soil fluffier and um, allow for the uh, when we plant for the roots to be able to go deeper and deeper. So on the right, you'll see a baby coffee plant that was planted um, about four months before this picture, three, maybe three months before this picture. Um, and you can see that its root system has actually gone uh, quite a bit deep into the soil. So this was a land that we, for a year before we planted, um, we planted cover crops um, and different kinds of uh, rotations, um, which we used for the, the feed for the cattle and, and whatnot um, to help uh, change a land that was once rented out for sugarcane and had been fairly compacted into becoming a more wet and fluffier soil. So um, then we planted cover crops uh, the year that we planted. So um, now that you have the, the sort of understanding of what your soil is and how it's looking, again, I would say that um, preparing the home for the coffee, preparing that your coffee is gonna be happy and, and um, has a higher chance of success. Um, I think that I'm sort of pragmatic um, in, in my view of planting today. And that's uh, where it's, what's my end goal? What do I want to achieve? And I want to make sure that um, and I, at my farm, I'm growing an, or, an organic agroforest um, mechanized system. Um, and um, I, want to, I want to make sure that I'm successful um, on a production wise and efficiency um, and uh, financial way. So um, I've changed a bit from um, how we used to do in the past. And um, so right now I'm at uh, 27 hectares uh, planted, then I wanna get to 50 and then I wanna get to 100 on the farm. So that's my plan for the next five years. Um, and um, the, now that we've sort of got a model down, I uh, intend to start my coffee as organic as possible, but not yet certified organic. And that's because sometimes um, it's maybe interesting to, uh, make a correction um, on the soil um, to control uh, things like ants. Um, and ants, there are no, that I know of, um, easy way, organic way to handle um, ants. And um, we do all kind of, call it bioiscas, um, um, traps, uh, uh, I can't uh, translate that. It's uh, uh, organic uh, uh, compositions, uh, cocktails that we, tried to handle with the ants, but um, they, they um, especially in a tropical place, um, they, they tend to um, proliferate and uh, keep a lot of the uh, trees that we plant from coming up. So um, I would uh, eliminate the, the, the ants or control the ants um, in my coffee field before I would plant. And um, I would prepare the land first with a mix of different cover crops and to find what works in your uh, climate. Um, so as much, uh, I would say, usually increasing the diversity of that, of those cover crops, um, I would almost say the more, the, the, more, the better. Um, and, and it's really the diversity that helps increase the amount of life and micro uh, and macro um, bacteria and, and life in the soil. So um, that will help to create more biomass as well. Um, so in general, the diversity of the, ecos of the, um, of the uh, cover crops and the ecosystem uh, helps to bring a sort of balance. Now, uh, what we call pests, we also have uh, things that prey on them. So that's my, my opinion before we get started. So what does that look like? Um, this is a soil 
that uh, we are recovering. And this is um, a mix of seven different um, uh, cover crops. And um, in my hand, I'm holding a few of the seeds um, from them. So those are what uh, we call milietu, which is kind of uh, similar to corn leguminous uh, system. And then we have frutalaria, um, which is I think similar to a hemp, hemp, hemp uh, plant, um, sunflowers and, and other kinds of things like that. Um, so those root systems, they really help break in the soil. And then we, um, uh, as we cut them down, we, we mow them, we allow them to decompose um, and increase the biomass. So this is what it looks like um, before we plant. And so we did a year of, of cover crops and then we planted again the cover crops before we plant. So here in Brazil, uh, in my region, as the, as the uh, rainy season starts in October, and um, we're kind of in the midst of a, of a terrible dry season where we didn't have rain until November, but um, generally it starts raining in September, October. So we plant in uh, end of October or November um, or December, and um, we planted the cover crops uh, as the rain started and um, we prepared for the new planting. So here we were planting uh, seven hectares of a variety called Arara. And um, as you see, we tilled, this, we tilled the land um, to plant the um, cover crops. And then we opened up the, the lines of the rows of the coffee. Um, and um, I think that in general, I would say it's safe to say that the least, the less that you move or break up the land, till the land, generally the better. Um, but in the case of cover crops, a lot of times, depending on what kind of brush you have in Brazil, we have lots of really aggressive types of grass, like elephant grass. Um, it's, it's generally uh, really tough for the cover crops to come out and beat these the, these grass. So so tilling the land really works in order to to get a, a rich cocktail of of cover crops. Um, and I would do this for the first year to first three years um, as um, in our system as the as the trees start to come up. So um, this is a very very good system to prepare the land as you're about to plant and have a, a nice nice um, home for the plant. So besides that, um, we, we um, add uh, compost and a different um, composition to uh, inside the, the row um, and um, uh, to, to make sure that that plant is going to um, have a lot of food as it um, accust gets accustomed to the, uh, the soil. So now we um, prepared the land. We know what kind of soil we have. We know what kind of uh, area we have. And um, we wanted to decide what do we want to plant? And um, I think um, going back to that analogy of coffee as a beverage, um, you know, nowadays, especially if you want to go into specialty coffee, it's, it's a wise choice to, to think of what the end product is going to be. As commodity, it's kind of like a grain. It's kind of like growing corn or soy or anything um, and you just deliver it to a, um, a warehouse like a, a middleman or a warehouse and sell it at the market price and that's kind of it but generally in our market it's about um, connecting uh, a flavor connecting a consumer connecting a roaster um, so choosing the variety is a mix of uh, choosing a variety that's adapted to your area adapted and the genetics makes sense with the terroir if you want to highlight some kind of flavor or another. My terroir, um, again, we have a very dry harvest season. And so we do natural process coffees um, and we get these kind of fresh fruits or dried fruits uh, or berries um, to our coffees. Um, and we have uh, not much of a risk of uh, phenolic or Rio. Um, so, so I really love the natural process. We do some washed process and some pulp natural, but I really love the aromatics and the, and the juiciness and the, and the added complexity that comes from that. Um, and that also goes really well with my um, terroir, which is 
kind of dry. So we have these big swings of temperature from cold nights to warm days. And this really helps to develop um, sugars. Um, and um, the fruits here are very sweet. Um, so we have um, generally very sweet coffee. I think Brazil in general is known for sweet coffees, but our region is particularly creamy, like a very dense body in the cup and a very sweet cup and a very long finishes. Now with my variety choice, I could enhance that um, body um, characteristic or sweetness, or I could uh, increase the amount of acidity or decrease the amount of acidity. And so thinking of uh, what, I, what I'm gonna do um, in the flavor in the cup, but also what is gonna be uh, most um, efficient and productive and resistant to the different kinds of um, prob uh, issues that I may have in my area. So uh, leaf rust or uh, leaf miner or nematodes or stuff like that. In general, I think the most, <clears throat> after preparing the land, of course, the most important thing is choosing a variety that is going to do well on your farm. Um, so um, also choosing what else are you going to plant along with that coffee if you're going to plant anything else and is it going to be um, to a working plant like to add nutrients or is it going to be also another form of cash crop. So um, we have a, a nursery on our farm and um, I think it's uh, always wise even if uh, you have a small nursery to do some kind of research and some kind of uh, uh, selection of the best plants that are adapted to your farm so that over the generations that you can ensure um, the best um, genetics um, and the most adapted genetics to your farm. So um, on the left, I have a variety called Obata. And Obata is a variety developed in Brazil. Um, it's um, uh, created in the state of Sao Paulo and um, it comes from a Sarshimor uh, blend. So from Vila Sarshi and hybrid of Timor, um, it's about 90% Arabica and um, it's a very late ripening um, varietal. And for my farm, that's very interesting because I, my coffee is between 800 meters and a thousand meters. Um, now I'm pretty far away from the equator. So um, that would be much higher uh, near the equator, but um, it's still um, uh, not, not the highest altitude. So basically um, my grandfather, let's say my grandfather used to pick around, he said that the picking used to start around June 20th, June 25th every year. And now, depending on the varieties, harvest is starting around April or early May. Um, so that is a significant change over the past 50 years in my environment. And um, what I want is that my coffees, they don't start ripening until uh, the rains have stopped. Um, so I don't run the risk of, of um, having Rio or that the coffees are knocked off the tree. And also I'm really, really trying to get the, the, the berries to start to ripen when the cold sets in, when the winter sets in. So that gives me more time on the, on the tree for nutrients, uh, more time for the leaves to really do photosynthesis and provide sugar in the cherry, um, which I will use for fermentation and also give me a longer time to pick, um, especially at the ripe, ripest stage. So Obata has been a, um, a variety that's been tasting very well. And the difference from an early uh, ripening variety like Bourbon to Obata is more than, um, almost more than 60 days, almost more, yeah, more than two months basically, um, which is um, in, the, in, in the cup score, is giving me a difference of more than four four points uh, consistently in the cups. Uh, so um, in other farms, that that um, that may actually be inverse uh, relationship with cup score, but on my farm, that's how it's going. Uh, so um, it's also quite resistant and and um, and uh, gives an interesting cup profile. On the right is SL28, which I brought from a, a Ruiru uh, station um, from outside of Nairobi, Kenya. And um, I, I went to see some uh, producers and, and 
processing stations in Kenya. And I found this variety to be very delicious and um, tasty and okay uh, in terms of, of resistance, um, but uh, had a nice sort of crisp blackcurrant acidity, which I'm sure you guys have tasted. Um, and um, so I decided to go on in two directions here in terms of uh, my farm. It's the um, varieties that are less risk and uh, safer bet. And so they're more adapted to my, um, to my uh, soil and my climate. And that will give me um, a coffee that's very useful and, and aligned with my terroir. So I aim for an 84 to 86 point score. Um, I probably have 70% of the farm planted in this, this, um, this types. And I have three varieties that I primarily plant, which is Obata uh, and Arara. Arara is a yellow uh, uh, version of Obata and even a little bit more resistant, um, also very late ripening. Um, and Paraíso, which is all three of these developed in Brazil. Paraíso is um, um, a little bit, um, it's, it's, it's uh, medium uh, ripening. Um, so not early, not late. Um, so it's a little bit before Obatam, but very resistant to dry weather, to drought, um, very nematode resistant, and just gives this huge creamy body and brown sugar honey sweetness that goes along with um, what a lot of my customers use my coffees for, which is espresso. Um, so uh, cold brew and espresso. And with the other varieties, I'm looking for um, something that I enjoy drinking as a filter coffee. So nowadays um, we do a lot of studies um, and we probably have more than 400 varieties that we're studying um, on the field. And um, this is uh, year eight of our studies. So it takes a long time to study a new new varieties but um, so <clears throat> this right here is from uh, originally from one of the forests of Ethiopia uh, from Welicho and then we germinated um, and um, we planted and we we treat, treated each plant as a uh, one variety every each mother plant as one and we um, we tra tracked them over the years for um, if they're uh, resistant uh, or not, or what kind of weaknesses they have. If they're very weak, we decided to eradicate them. If they're um, tall, medium, or short, um, if they produce uh, high, uh, high yields or not, um, and um, if they're early, medium, or late ripening, and, um, and also sensory. Um, so we have... Um, um, a bit of a, a give and take, like do we make more saplings or do we separate uh, some to taste? And um, we've identified uh, so far um, <clears throat> several that we think are really uh, interesting. So at my at my uh, altitude, um, I've been able to have some really stunning, stunning cups that um, my uh, many of uh, very highly trained buyers, uh, cuppers and buyers. And I agree that we consider that to be a micro lot tasting coffee. Um, and I think more interesting than anything, um, we start to develop something unique that has our own signature taste. And I think that's what's most, most the best thing a farmer can do is have someone um, or an artist or anything, they sort of recognize that your trace, your taste, your signature, um, you know, you have some really winning varieties like geisha, but all of a sudden everyone has geisha and uh, you can't really trace it back to, to one farm. So um, once you um, find uh, what you want to plant and that sort of uh, always, uh, you can always be playing with that and changing that. Um, but let's plant the, plant the coffee field. And with that, um, again, it's about providing a house that the home, that that the coffee is comfortable in, that's balanced and um, that it's gonna be uh, happy and healthy um, and also productive. So um, windbreakers are very important because the diseases and viruses, they come from the, from the wind. Um, as we have learned with the pandemic, um, um, 
so is true with the plants. So uh, making sure that, um, that, uh, that the trees are protected as much as possible. Uh, again, tilling the land as little as possible once the trees are planted, a coffee is planted, um, unless you're planting uh, a cash crop or something in between. Um, and then, so what kind of spacing am I going to plant now that I know the variety and I know what I'm going to do? What kind of biodiversity do I want? And do I want uh, some kind of agroforest system or not? So I think there's no one answer to that. Um, I think everyone has a different kind of climate. If you're in a higher altitude and you get less sun, maybe you want to have less trees. Um, but on my farm, I'm testing several different ways, but this is one of them that um, that um, we're feeling quite confident about. And so if you imagine we plant trees in the row of the coffee um, every five meters, and then we jump three rows and we plant on the fourth row. Um, so this permits me to have an agroforestry system um, where 75% of the uh, coffee field can be fully mechanized and even mechanically harvest at some point. So, um, and then the one, the row with the, with the coffee, I would harvest uh, by hand or by um, um, something handheld. And um, at here, this system, we have 60% working trees, uh, leguminous trees. So I call working trees, they're trees that will improve my soil, improve um, the, the, the um, humidity. Um, of course, the trees will shade, which is very interesting. Um, but uh, by choosing uh, leguminous trees, um, you can fix up to 200 tons of nitrogen um, per uh, hectare. Um, and um, there's, I think, if you can have a more diversity, that's always a good thing. Um, and uh, at our farm, we walk the farm and we look for leguminous trees that are on the farm that are healthy and we make seeds from them in our nursery. So that's the cheapest and actually best way to select what to plant uh, with your coffee. And you can kind of look at the formation of the tree. I look for trees that um, they grow geometrically straight up and they have uh, either small leaves or they have a very, um, uh, their, their, their roots, their, their shade system is very punctual. Um, so I look for trees that, um, that we're gonna con we're going to um, try to send them high. Um, we're going to um, uh, cut the branches and keep them going straight up. Um, and um, over time, we will have an evenly dispersed shade all over throughout the whole uh, system. And so um, the 40% of the other trees will be what we call uh, hardwood trees, trees that I'll sell for wood. So that'll be another uh, uh, it's kind of insurance that I have um, if something goes wrong or we generally conduct a coffee field for about 30 years, um, which is about the time we need to redo our coffee uh, field and we can sell the wood to refinance that. Um, so if you can interspace the different types of trees um, and so you don't have the same trees close to each other, that's always best. So this is a field that's starting. Um, this is in its third year. Um, this is actually every third row instead of every fourth row. But um, here uh, we have um, mahogany and uh, we just planted leguminous trees um, this year. So they'll be coming up. There'll be a little bit more shade coming up. But um, this is uh, um, starting to, to look and, and it'll take five, six years uh, for your trees to start to make some serious kind of shade. <coughs> so choosing the trees um, and then making the saplings, um, putting them, uh, planting them and protecting them from the ants. Um, here we put cotton uh, around the tree to help um, make a barrier from the ants. Uh, you can also use this with um, some kind of uh, even like a two liter bottle of soda um, around the, uh, the, the baby tree, the ants won't be able to go up. Just make sure that you uh, don't leave lots of trash um, uh, in, the, in the coffee field after that. But um, this is an Australian cedar. 
I really like the Australian cedar with my coffee. It's a, it's a as you see, it's a very thin leaf um, and it um, loses its leaves uh, in the winter time. And so producing coffee where I am is very different than producing at the equator like Colombia because Colombia, it's sort of the same temperature all year round and the same amount of sunlight all year round. There's just a part of the year that rains a little bit more and a part of that rains a bit less. We actually have four very distinct seasons um, and uh, it's uh, 5 p.m. over here and it's already uh, getting dark. So um, they lose their leaves right around May, which is May and June, which is the beginning of winter. And um, they sort of open the shades or the curtains to the coffee field. And there's a lot more uh, sun to, uh, for photosynthesis. And this way I can keep um, my production high and um, my coffee getting enough photosynthesis and producing a lot of um, flowers. Um, so here I am with Roberta, who's my uh, field manager. Uh, she's a trained agronomist and she, uh, together with, uh, um, we have a private agronomist who comes once a month. They make the plan, uh, monthly plan, uh, semester uh, plan and yearly plan of what needs to be done. Um, I can't stress enough how, uh, especially when you're more organic or more sustainable, how important it is to be disciplined and be on time, uh, especially if you're doing, um, you know, uh, compostings and um, creating, treating the brush without herbicides and stuff you really really don't want to get behind on what you have to do so here we're planting uh, all kinds of different um trees that leguminous we have australian cedar we have gladysigia we have inga two types of inga uh erythrina uh inga is um is fantastic um we we kind of call it the 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 um number 10 which is usually the best player on the soccer team so um inga is, is really a fantastic tree. Um, this in this um, uh, picture, you can see how uh, the brush during the summer really comes up, especially when the trees are not formed yet. Uh, and um, the most expensive part of, of tending to plants um, when you don't use chemicals like herbicides is tending to the brush. So that it'll grow a month in, uh, it'll go a meter in a month. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been trying to mechanize and what we, this is uh, basically something you put onto your tractor. It's called a lateral trincha. Uh, I don't know what it's called. It's a sort of a rolling uh, thing that cuts the, um, these blades that cut the grass. Um, we keep it a little bit above so they don't hit the ground. Um, and they cut the brush and they let the brush sort of sit around the coffee plant, um, decomposing and keeping, keeping the, the, the grass uh, from going down. And um, this, uh, if you're able to mechanize, is, um, really brings down the amount of uh, people that, uh, that you need. Um, today, I run my, I have 27 hectares. I run my farm with... Um, I actually have five people uh, uh, on the coffee and I have two tractors, two people on tractors and I share them with other <clears throat> things on the farm, but mainly that's, and then when I need um, a, a lot of work, like uh, with the t uh, tending to the brush or to harvest or planting, I hire um, a temporary uh, people from, from the town. Uh, and um, to, uh, this is about a third of the amount of people that um, my mom used to uh, have on salary a few years ago. So um, yeah, I think uh, there's, there's definitely ways that you can bring down uh, the amount of cost. And this is, this is huge, is keeping the brush down. Um, and um, there are many ways that you can use to um, uh, use uh, different bio uh, mass uh, uh, to keep um, the, the, the plants happy and healthy. We have a lot of banana we use as windbreakers and different things. Um, and we have, we're in the middle of one of the worst uh, 
dry uh, spells and um, we don't have irrigation. So what we did was we cut the banana stalks and um, we uh, put them around our, our, our baby plants um, and they've been keeping quite well um, as their root systems are not so low. So um, the other thing is the wind. The wind is um, a huge factor in dehydrating uh, the land. And so as we have um, a climate that rain is increasingly um, sporadic and in a short period, um, we have a consultant who does um, soil recovery, but he used to say that we had to do a summer cover crops and winter cover crops. And we just could never do it because uh, we would plant and it wouldn't rain or, or we just couldn't do everything on time. So recently we decided to only do summer cover crops uh, a little bit later. So instead of planting in October, we plant in December and we would allow those summer uh, cover crops to, to, to stay the entire year. Um, and then we would mow one row and not the other. And then in the next year, we would do the other and not, and, and not the one that was, uh, and leave the one that was mowed. Um, so basically, um, as you can see, um, last year we had, last year we had the worst drought uh, in the last, I don't know, 75 years, um, which is hiccuping, hiccuping into this year. And the coffee is looking good. Um, that's a baby tree that was just planted that year. Um, and um, the windbreaker is, um, is protecting uh, the, the coffee and the, the banana stalks are keeping it humid. Um, and um, my coffee is looking like uh, there's no problem at all. So um, that lasted, that drought lasted seven months and um, the coffee developed fine. Um, and here's windbreakers um, in, the, in, a, in a more adult coffee field. As you can see in the back, the bananas. Um, and um, bananas are great windbreakers. Um, you, you can also have them as a cash crop. Um, the one thing is they do take a lot of work to manage because they, they reproduce and they grow and spread uh, very fast. So uh, I use them uh, sparingly um, as um, you, you need to make sure that you keep them uh, under control. So um, compost, I think, is um, really important, um, you know, understanding where you're going to get your um, fertilizer and how are you going to make your fertilizer. Um, obviously, I'm organic, so um, I think that um, the, you see a lot of organic farms start out of uh, a belief in being organic in the system. And then we call them in, in Portuguese, we say larga nico. Largar means like to, um, to just uh, uh, give up. And it's uh, a given up organic. You see these sort of really sad trees. And then you have more examples of people saying, see, organic doesn't work. So I think that it's really important to think of how you're going to get enough food um, to those plants that they need. Um, so just as when you start planting, you need to start thinking of, okay, am I going to be buying my fertilizer or buying my compost, or am I going to be making my compost? And I think that um, uh, making compost is a fantastic way of keeping costs down, keeping your carbon footprint down, creating more biomass. Um, I think that in general, um, a well-made um, compost can increase the amount of microorganisms that you're inputting into the system. Um, it's more biomass for the microorganisms to, to degrade. And um, it just brings the, the symbiosis um, with the, the microorganisms and the coffee root system um, to be, have a healthier relationship and a better structure for the soil. So <clears throat> we made a patio and um, we basically um, mix uh, coffee, skin, uh, whatever, biomass we have from our wood shop or, or we take, um, uh, you know, uh, elephant grass, um, sorgo, which is a similar to a corn, um, and uh, manure from the, from the, um, from the cows. We also purchase manure from the um, chicken, uh, from a local chicken, um, uh, shed. 
And, um, you know, we take a soil analysis if we need to enrich with some kind of phosphorus or some, something that we take a rock dust or uh, who knows. Uh, we bioactivate every now and then. Uh, we're not biodynamic. We've, we've played a little bit with it, but I'm, I'm still really trying to get the, I call it the rice and beans together before I start doing full on biodynamic. Um, that's a whole nother uh, topic, but um, we have done some preparation. So I really like to do some bioactivation preparations on the compost. Um, and um, the rule for me is basically keeping the temperature uh, high so that it, um, it uh, degrades, but don't let it go above 75 degrees Celsius. So when that happens, uh, make sure you move. Um, so you cool it down, um, you let air go into the system. And then, uh, but if it's below 75, uh, really don't move, move it as little as possible. So let those microorganisms do their thing, do their work. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that hopefully you can get enough nitrogen into the system um, and, um, and um, see where you can get enough uh, organic matter. And um, whatever you have on your farm or region that um, you think may work, that you come up with a system. So here we're in the dry season, but we're taking the, uh, the basically the, um, the water that comes out of the uh, milking area, the cow milking area, um, where the cows, um, they are milked each day and they wash the ground and um, that mixes with manure and with all this other stuff and with the, with the pea and, um, and um, we spread that on the, on the, on the coffee. And um, that brings again, a whole, uh, uh, besides uh, humidity, lots of bacteria, lots of, lots of life into the system. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit on just, um, you know, pest control and disease control. And I think that the best way to keep the pests and, and, and your uh, diseases away is to, to be healthy, um, to, to keep a healthy plant, keep it happy, keep it uh, in, a, in a good home. I think that the best way that we've seen without being too polemic, but to deal with viruses is to be healthy, you know, keeping our health in check, you know, so that, um, you know, when something like COVID comes around that we can, our body can, overcome it. Um, so, you know, they, a lot of people say that the next big problem is going to be when we, we run out of, uh, you know, antibiotics stop working because our bodies have become weak. So, um, you know, I think that uh, choosing varieties that work well um, are always going to be um, the health, the, the, the safest bet, especially for things like leaf rust or leaf miner, um, um, you know, you have leaf rust resistant varieties. Uh, that's really the best way to handle it. But of course, um, you know, you're going to have maybe something exotic or another that you're going to have for a special reason. Um, just know that you're going to have to do as many foliar sprays or copper or whatever that you can handle. Uh, but um, it'll take a little bit more work. So, um, um, yeah, I think that. Um, the, the, you know, there's coffee pour, there's leaf mon uh, miner uh, as an issue for us. Um, monitoring as much as you can. Um, so like, for example, in the leaf miner, which is starting right around now, um, that's something that we need to monitor at the dry season as they appear. There's all different kinds of ways to do a, uh, analysis, but here in Brazil, we, we take a hundred plants. Um, we randomly walk around. We take uh, two leaves uh, randomly from, from um, two sides of the plant. And um, if, if you find uh, even one to three in a hundred, then it's time to, uh, to, uh, to spray. And we do a, a neem, neem oil extract um, spray. Um, so um, again, um, creating a, a place with high biodiversity is the best, um, the best actual um, defense uh, to uh, proactive defense. So this is a pacamara tree on my farm, and um, I've decided not to plant any more pacamara because it's just too much work. I have to spray all the time, uh, um, copper sprays and stuff like that. So. Um, uh, it's interesting. The cup is interesting, uh, but uh, it's not something I'm investing in. Um, and then, 
Here is uh, a coffee borer. Um, and uh, in this picture, the, the little black, it's not as, uh, as focused, but um, if you can see the little black uh, thing is a coffee borer. It's a little bug that goes and eats the, the, the pulp. And um, what we sp sprayed was uh, Bovedu, which is a sort of fungi um, that is the little white thing. And that little white thing is eating the coffee borer. Uh, this is uh, organic. Um, um, this is a, a um, living uh, system that counterbalances the um, the coffee borer. So um, uh, there, it's doing it's doing its work. So um, keeping a, a high uh, balance system, um, it will keep the uh, pests under control. And I think um, the last thing I wanted to um, to uh, close with is that I can't underscore how important having um, a team that is uh, working well together and diversified team. If you're gonna work with a diversified um, uh, system, um, it's really hard to find one person, I would say impossible, that have the, the, the knowledge to handle um, so many different um, things. I think, I think humans, we've kind of uh, forgotten how to plant um, naturally um, and in Brazil the most common uh, fertilizer that is sold the most uh, the most sold fertilizer is called super simple it's, it's uh, super simple and it has um, all you need in terms of NPK and uh, magnesium and what's up whatsoever and uh, the agronomist they come around uh, for free and they um, they give you a soil analysis and tell you what you should put on and uh, a lot of times they work for fertilizer companies. And um, so that's just uh, a system where the, the farmer has stopped using their brain uh, and thinking what, what, what they would use. So um, I would say that the, uh, the, the, especially if you're going towards more sustainable, we have in this picture on the right, um, some of our team um, that's, um, from left to right, that's me. And then Murilo, who's an uh, uh, agronomist who comes um, once every three months. Uh, he's uh, very good with uh, trees, which trees to plant and what system has been helping us refine uh, how to mechanize uh, the agroforestry. Then Roberta is my, she works full-time on the farm um, and the field manager. Uh, the next person over uh, is, uh, Alexandre, he's the president of IBD, uh, which is the company that uh, does the organic inspection certification for us. Um, and we've been really picking his brain as to um, what are the, the best techniques that we can be successful as organic farmers. And then uh, the next guy is our agronomist, Zeho Mil, uh, who comes once a month. Um, and he um, has been uh, great. Uh, he's not. Uh, he's a farmer. He had never worked with organic, and um, he's been uh, uh, learning with us and uh, using our farm as well to learn different techniques and spread to all the other farmers in our community. And the last guy, uh, Leandro is um, or Leonardo is a water consultant. So uh, uh, other parts of sustainability on the farm, such as um, water. Uh, uh, capturing water from springs and we just made a well for uh, the water that we process the coffee from uh, so that we have pristine water uh, to wash coffee and uh, and water filtration after the um, the the uh, terraces um, so uh, we both have uh, we can from the um, that we deliver water back into the system uh, clean. So yeah, I think that you know um, a lot of this stuff. I think farmers have heard of before. Or a lot of uh, is things that you may have studied, but really putting into practice is is um, is the hard part. Really having things uh, methodical, disciplined, and um, and uh, it's really all about having a, a team that believes what you're doing. Um, so. When I took the farm over from my parents uh, three, four years ago uh, to today, I think I've, I've changed more than 90% of the staff uh, to people that were on board with what we wanted to do. So um, 
so so yeah i think um i'll ben uh that's that's what i had to share I've open it up to questions um just want to give you guys an idea of what it looks like uh right now what we're doing and um welcome anyone to come visit us uh here at faf um and uh we're excited for what we can do in the future hmm. All right, thank you so much, Felipe. That was an absolutely fantastic presentation. I jotted down some questions for you, but we'll come back to those after uh, Marta's presentation. So Marta, without further ado, I'm turn it over to you and put myself on mute. Can you see my screen? I don't see. Yeah, I we, don't see. Oh, we okay, great, screen. okay. It's not it's full yet. Now, yeah, okay. Okay, it's all good now? It's great. Okay. So um, my presentation today is about the plants, um, which could be a nice companions for the coffee orchards for our growers. The first slide is just a little bit about myself because I'm not a professionally horticulturist. I actually spent most of my career working for technology companies, mostly genomics technology companies, bioinformatics companies. And I ran research and development lab in Davis uh, for, our, for our company, but um, three years, uh, but I always was um, involved with plants. I am, um, I have this extreme hobby of growing fruiting plants. And three years ago, when I joined Fringe Company, that becomes uh, my professional activity too. So now everything I'm growing, I'm trying to introduce to the farm and I'm trying to introduce to the growers. And during this presentation, I'll try to make sense of it. So on this very first slide, um, this is our small greenhouse space where I grow various um, coffee plants, this is our germplasm plants, and we propagate them there and um, observe and um, yeah, basically introduce new germplasm to them. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, many different fruiting plants for the orchards, but um, uh, I grow a lot of different plants. I grow maybe dozens or hundreds of different species, but today I decided I will concentrate just on 10 species. And uh, usually when I'm giving um, different talks, mostly to hobbyists, gardeners, hobbyists, um, I usually break my presentation into seasons. So I'm structuring this presentation in the same way because I notice that the farmers operate also by seasons. They often have different crops for different seasons which they sell. So they don't overlap, or if they overlap, they overlap a little. So for spring fruits, I will be talking about three different species, mulberries, Suriname cherries, but with Philippe present on the same call, I should call it pitanga, not Suriname cherry, but it's the same thing. But in Brazil, it's a Brazilian fruit, so they call it pitanga over there. Uh, Suriname cherry, I think that name came later in, in the history. And look what? So let's start from mulberries. So why mulberries? Well, first of all, there are a lot of different mulberries and they perform a very different and can, can play very different roles in the orchards. And I was thinking about, since I grow a number of cultivars, um, I was thinking about uh, what, what, which one would be the best actually to use in our coffee plantings. And after some time, I realized that the, probably the best one uh, will be a small bush, a small, small tree or small bush. Uh, and that cultivar I have, which is called Four Seasons Mulberries or Taiwanese Four Seasons, there is actually another one very similar in the function. Yeah, world, world's best. That's another mulberry, which can serve a very similar function. 
Okay, why? Well, first of all, it produces the fruits year round. What it means that even if you don't pick the fruits and you don't sell the fruits, they're going to drop to the ground. And their function would be, will be increasing the organic content of the soil and improving the microflora in the soil. They produce a lot of fruits. The inputs are very low. So for mulberries, there is very limited water you need to provide, if any, even in our uh, very high uh, summer heat and dry situations. So they don't need much water, but the outputs are quite high because they have very strong root systems. Uh, so the main function of this particular bush, which is a small bush, about maybe three meters, which is about um, three meters, 10 feet, about 10, 10, 10, yeah, 10 feet height. So, uh, so that's uh, that's a one option. That's that's an option mostly for the soil improvement. For the fruits, yes, the fruits can be some additional cash, but uh, the fruits are no, don't have much of a shelf life. So these fruits should be consumed very quickly. Uh, they can be. Um, delivered to local markets or they can be distributed through the um, grocery deli delivery companies. So that's another option for the growers who wants to use this kind of a mulberry. So this mulberry can be easily incorporated into the coffee orchards interplanted with coffee trees. It's about the same size as a coffee tree. So, and you can see this fruit. So this, this black fruits are for season mulberry fruit. A world's best, which is very similar. The fruits are less um, complex. This is actually very tasty fruits as soon as we have enough heat for them. Uh, world's best, a little bit less complex fruits, but their storage life actually a little bit better. Um, yeah, that's that's probably about uh, about it about the about and the most important actually for this one it's basically produced all year long in the tropical environment that came from a Taiwan so it um, it fruits um, in my situation because I have actual uh, winter and these three leaves but in um, in um, more warm situations it will be evergreen actually and that will be fruiting year year long even in my situation it fruits into december and i'm in northern california okay the next three i'm going to talk about is lockwood uh, we're starting to experiment with it on the farm we already planted it at our farm woodland organics it's a large evergreen tree and this tree is suitable not only as a fruit crop but it's also suitable as a windbreak and a shade tree and there are a number of cultivars number of very good cultivars i grow at least a couple of dozens of this um Unfortunately, they are not easy to obtain. There is no easy way to find good cultivars, but it's actually not necessary for, um, uh, if you just use them as a structural trees for windbreaks or shade trees. So any seedlings can be planted. If you are planning to do also fruit productions, there is a couple of cultivars included into this presentation. Argelina, for example, can be grafted. Um, it is very late. It's coming from Spain. It's very late cultivar. It's a uh, very complex and flavor. It's um, very juicy. It's very sweet. It has. It's almost like a mango flavor, um, and very complex. It's basically a flavor bomb. This cultivar, and it's very large too. And for the early look, what and it's a white, so it's a very different one. I would like to point this this cultivar which is called AIDS Delight. It's more mild, but it's also it has a bit less acid, but it's also very early. So and another cultivar here is a Fletcher White. So so basically these species can play all three functions for the cash crop for fruits as a wind breaks and as a shade tree. And look what is fruits that are very known outside of the United States on many markets outside of the United States. I have no idea about Brazil, 
um, didn't see it there, but if you go to any Sp uh, Spanish, I mean Spanish in Spain, like if you go to Barcelona market, you will see loquats always over there. You will see nicely packed loquats in China, in Japan, in Italy. Um, basically, yeah, it's a, it's a, it can be quite, a, a, if properly packed, uh, properly presented, it can be a good additional cash crop for the coffee farmers. And it can be shipped. So this can be, uh, can be shipped. So it's, it, it doesn't have a um, long shelf life, but it has enough for um, uh, shipments and for uh, market deliveries and delivering from, through distributors too. Okay, so now going to uh, Pitanga, and I have this particular cultivar which I called Guaruja Red, uh, and this, uh, these are very fun fruits. And this, uh, as this particular cultivar, if you, and we have quite a bit of them on the farm actually, and this particular, uh, um, particular. Um, Accession I just introduced recently, I made some grafts and planted it there. Uh, the flavor of this one is really intense. It's sweet and um, it also has acid. It has really nice citrusy notes and pitangas can be very different in how they grow. Some of them just like to be ground covers and we don't want those. We want those ones which are vigorous, uh, grow upright and form nice trees, nice small trees and also productive. So this particular accession basically does this all. It's probably some kind of a hybrid, maybe from subspecies Deciblasta, which is coming from, I believe, Southern Brazil. Um, um, so, uh, Shelf life is very, very short, unfortunately. So this fruit is very similar in function to the shrubby mulberries. So very good for improvement of the soil organics, soil bacterial composition, because the fruits will be dropping uh, a lot. And the fruits also can be sell, sold by just locally because shipment, shipment this, of this fruits is a problematic, but local markets and um, um, grocery delivery companies uh, uh, could, be do, could be doing that. So if you want to distribute it through them, that's, that's a good one. Uh, now moving into summer, here I have four fruits which I would like to introduce, namely dwarf grumichama, again another Brazilian fruit, uh, dragon fruits, oak leaf papaya, and prasopis. So they all for here. I will start from this dwarf grumichama, which is Eugenia Itaguahensis. So this is very new, and I'm just starting to introduce it uh, to our farm. Uh, it's similar as a fruit the, in the size and shape, they're similar to pitanga, but they actually have much um, denser skin and these guys actually can be shipped. And the tree has much larger leaves, shiny leaves, and its appearance is actually prettier, I would say, than the pitanga tree. So the function is very similar to pitanga, so improvement of the soil composition um, in terms of organics and microflora, and uh, the fruits can be shipped. And the tree is relatively small. Again, it's probably under two to three meters, which is like um, eight to maybe eight, nine, eight, nine uh, foot tall tree. Uh, a tree is similar to another one, oak leaf papaya. Again, for soil improvement, uh, small fruits is basically a papaya berry. But very noticeable fact for this uh, particular papaya is it's very cold tolerant. So these trees uh, survive easily 23 Fahrenheit. I'm trying to figure out in Celsius, probably minus, minus four, minus five, something like that degrees. So, and they survive, they delive during these temperatures, but if we are in mild uh, situations, they will be, they will be uh, evergreen. 
So the trees, uh, I planted the trees, first my trees I planted in 2017 and they produced already by end of that year. So they're very fast fruiting trees from seed. Uh, only females will produce the fruit. So that's the thing we need to consider if we ever going to use them because the males uh, will be just using the nutrients and providing the pollen, but not really not really uh, adding a lot of organic ma matter because these fruits will be dropping. So the fruits in the size, they are pretty small. Uh, this is this is a small grape, so I have them here. They're very useful in salads. They are sweet and spicy. The flavor is similar to um, condensed sweet uh, milk flavor, but they also have a seeds, which is like, um, you know, if you have a bite uh, onto papaya seeds, you know that they're spicy. So if you add them into salads, they're very useful. And females can be grafted into males. So here I have a graft. And in three years, they become really tall trees, uh, probably 15, like 15, 16 uh, foot trees. Um, they actually can be interplanted with coffee and they will not take much of space from coffee because uh, there is nothing uh, low down and they will provide a light shade too. Uh, now going on to real cash crop can be, and we grow quite a bit of this on our farm in Galita, dragon fruits. So if our coffee farmers want to grow dragon fruits, um, the first thing to consider is how you're going to grow them they really need structures. Those uh, farmers who already have avocado trees very often will plant um, pitahayas um, under avocado trees and those just will climb the avocados um, and uh, will produce, but production will be relatively low in such situations. What you really want for uh, dragon fruits, you really want to have a good structures. And they, those could be a concrete structures with some wooden poles here. They can be completely out of wood, but ideally you want to grow them in some kind of a palm shape. Um, the other thing to consider with Peter High is um, which ones do you want to grow? Most of the white flesh ones, they are um, species undatus, they are self-fertile and you don't need to think about pollination too much as long as you have some insect presence like bees or bumblebees or carpenter bees, if they are present, they will pollinated, but most of the red fleshed ones, which are high in the value, Actually, they are not self-pollinating, but there are some cultivars which are self, uh, not self-fertile. Self so basically they're able to accept their own, own pollen and form the fruit. And here are two examples, Santa Barbara Red and Sugar Dragon, um, they are um, self-fertile. Uh, if you don't have pollinators, you can, uh, yeah, you, you would have to take a brush into your hands and go pollinate at night. Uh, transferring pollen from different different varieties in between them so but this uh, there is not much of uh, input to the soil from this uh, from these particular wines uh, if you're picking the fruits because the root system is very shallow uh, but they are um, just monetary value if you sell the fruits are quite high okay and the last and probably most important um Three I want to introduce is uh, prosopis. Right now, well, about three years ago, I started introducing this crop. Um, as soon as I joined company, I started introducing this crop um, to our growers and onto our farm. Uh, there are a number of species, uh, white carob, Chilean mesquite, velvet mesquite, honey mesquite. They all, these all species from America, Southern and um, North and Central America. And they all produce this wonderful, uh, wonderful pots. And these pots actually been used uh, very long uh, ago. Well, very far, very far in, in, um, in the times of, uh, before the Colombian ways by uh, native populations of Americas, because these pots are, are very high in nutrients and um, 
and can be utilized definitely as a cash crop if you collect uh, if you collect the beans and if you start distributing uh, the processed products from these beans. Even as a fresh fruit, these pods can be eaten. Uh, dry pods go into the flour. It can be stored. Uh, can be made into drinks, butters, pastry, and various supplements. So if you just go on Google and search, uh, you will find a lot of um, a lot of uh, prasopis flour products. Not a lot, but there are some people who started doing that, and it's they have pretty high in value actually. And uh, the pods um, have up to very high protein content, a lot of sugar, so they're very sweet. Some fiber, uh, some fat, and uh, minerals, they're actually very rich in uh, potassium. And drinks, in Texas, you actually can drink a cocktail out of Prasopis. And I will be talking a little bit more about the tree structure uh, right by the end of this talk. So now moving on to fall and winter fruits. Here I decided, well, you know, I grow a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, different uh, fruits, uh, which fruit in fall and winter, I decided that now I will talk on only about these three ones, Fijoya, Inga, and Sinjet. So first of all, Fijoya. We actually started already experimenting on the farm with Fijoya borders around, the, around uh, coffee planting, using it as a secondary windbreak. So some function as a windbreak for this tree, but also this can be a high value crop because both fruits and flowers are delicious. I actually eat uh, these petals. These petals are very sweet. Uh, when you have your Fijoya trees are blooming, not everyone knows that you actually can just break these petals and eat them. There are a number of cultivars developed. Unfortunately, they are not very easy to access. There are no main major distributors of uh, good, um, good uh, cultivars. But fruits have this um, jelly inside. You just cut them open and you spoon out the flesh out of them. The fruits can be elongated. They can be perfectly round. They can be pointed. And I also do some, a little bit of my own selection on these fruits. And this is evergreen tree. And um, yeah, it's a small tree or large shrub. And they can be planted densely. And, um, and they're evergreen, so they will function as a secondary windbreak uh, year round. A lot of development on Fijoya cultivars have been done, even if it's not New Zealand fruit, it's a South American fruit, South Central American, it's Uruguay. Yeah, Uruguay is a main uh, origin of this fruit, I believe. Maybe in Brazil too. Um, in New Zealand, lots of development was done in New Zealand with this fruit. And in New Zealand, they have, um, it's, a, it's a one of uh, big fruit crops actually, and lots of cultivars available there, but many of them been imported already to the US. I have a wonderful collection and uh, it's just a matter of uh, propagation and distribu distribution of this, of this, um, of these cultivars. And when I grew up back in Soviet Union, it actually was a pretty known fruit. We ate it and it grew. Um, the producers in Abkhazia, it's a southern Georgia around Black Sea. That's where it was produced and former Soviet Union. And that was a kind of a normal fruit, which everyone knew, but in the United States somehow it's um, quite rare and not really common. Okay, and now going into Ingas. Well, I don't want to talk much about Inga. I just want to have one slide because everyone knows about Inga. Almost every coffee farmer grows Inga. It's a large uh, evergreen tree and it has really these large pods and they have sweet pulp. So these fruits can be sold and these trees are used as windbreaks and they're used as, um, as a shade trees. Uh, in coffee orchards, I have a little bit problem with Inga because it has very dense, a very dense foliage. 
but otherwise uh, it's it's incredibly useful tree and of course it's a nitrogen fixer so when i was talking about prosopis prosopis is also legume and it's also a nit nitrogen fixer okay the next three for the fall harvest i want to introduce is uh, Sanjad. It's a completely unknown in the US. Uh, very, uh, just very specific ethnic communities know about this, but otherwise it's unknown. But Eliagnus is a little bit more known in the US because, um, because of the Russian olive. And this is probably a cultivated form of Russian olive. There are also fruits which are known as gumi, uh, and that is Eliagnus multiflora. There are some hybrids also, and there is other Eliagnus which can be very useful. But I thought that this particular uh, selection, or not selection, this particular Eliagnus uh, species um, can be very useful. Well, because it functions, it, it, it works in different functions. It improves the soil composition because it, it's in symbiosis with uh, Francia and fixes nitrogen from the air. So it forms nodules. Um, it makes this, yeah, you can use it as a windbreak. It's a relatively high, it's a small tree, but it's a kind of a medium tree maybe. And it's a quite dense. I actually don't know how this tree will behave in a um, very warm climate. In my situation in Northern California, it actually loses foliage somewhere by mid of the winter. It may be, it, it's possible that it will not lose the foliage in Southern California. I will be introducing this, um, this tree uh, later this summer to our farm in Galita. So it can be used as a windbreak. I'm not sure about the shade tree for a coffee orchard. It just doesn't grow. It doesn't, doesn't have a nice tree structure. So that's why I would use it as a windbreak and I would use it as a secondary crop because it makes this uh, wonderful fruits. And this particular fruits, of course, it's, um, it's a cultural thing, but uh, in the Central Asian area, in the Middle Eastern area, everyone, where, everyone who celebrates Persian New Year, even in Turkey, it's not exactly Persian New Year, but it's um, that, that, that fruit is very well known for Persian New Year. You have to, take, have, you have, to have it on the table for, for the New Year celebration. In terms of fl flavor, it's just a powder. It's a nice, sweet, fruity powder. I actually was shocked uh, how close uh, the flavor of Sanjet is to the lucuma uh, flower. I recently bought lucuma flower and um, it's in this black bag. And when I compared this lucuma flower with the Sanjet, it was incredibly similar. First I thought, oh, someone sold me actually Sanjet flower as the lucuma flower but then i realized no it actually has more of lucuma flower here so lucuma specific flavors in this in this pack so sanjet is a thing of its own and um, it can be sold on markets especially during winter times uh, because i know at least one farm was very interested in this farm in bakersfield and they cater to santa monica market and uh all the people of um, Middle Eastern origin will be very interested in, uh, in purchasing this kind of fruits. And um, this fruit is very well storageable. It was one of those fruits which were moved through the Silk Road during ancient times because this can store basically forever because when you harvest the fruit, the fruit is dry. So multi multifunctional tree. So and here's a summary about all the trees I just talked to you about. And I put them like kind of, I tried to grade them uh, using between one and three stars and different qualities. Like for mulberry bush, I would say the fruit quality is probably just even not two, maybe one and a half because it's hard to sell it. Uh, but it gives a good soil benefit. For Suriname cherry, I would say that fruit probably a solid two, but soil, uh, soil benefit is three. For dragon fruit, uh, really high, really high fruit quality, soil benefit, no, I would put just one. I don't know why I have two stars here. One star should be here. 
for Sanjit, both for fruit quality because you can sell it and uh, for soil benefit because it's nitrogen fixing. And I'm putting here um, nitrogen fixators here in, in a blue background here. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the table with all the summaries. So um, some of these, so many of these will have a, like a dual function, a structural function for the garden, uh, protecting against uh, various um, uh, bio, uh, abiotic factors such as wind, um, such as wind and sun, and also producing fruits. But I want to. Um, uh, focus your attention on these three last ones uh, because these are large trees and uh, in my case they have um, almost except with, for ingas because I don't think in the quality of fruit can be given three I'm just giving it two but look what mesquites and ingas they are very useful and they are not useful just um when you're planting coffee orchard, but they actually, I believe, very useful before you start thinking about planting a coffee orchard. So these are the trees which probably can go before uh, the coffee plantation. So, and uh, and we uh, some of this we already had for a long time. So we were distributing inga trees to fringe growers. Prosopis, uh, here I'm introducing you the tree itself, uh, how this tree looks like. So this is a lone, this is established um, tree in the, in the, in the, in the Phoenix uh, garden. So if you don't maintain this tree, that's how it grows. But what I like is Philippe's presentation, what I noticed in his presentation, he also prunes his trees high. So the trunk, uh, starts um, branching very high. And I think that's what we have to do with most of our shade stream, maybe with all of our shade stream. So here I put my husband next to my three years old. Yeah, it's less than three years. It's actually two and a half years old um, uh, prosopis tree. So my husband has six foot uh, and I let branching starting at about five. And this is wrong. This should be starting definitely not so low. It should be starting somewhere from high as six or seven, six or seven foot height. That's where we should be should be letting our shade tree branching. So that's a beautiful feature of this mesquite's uh, foliage is uh, really, really fine leaves. So this is uh, prosopis leaves. Okay. And as I already said, they are nitrogen fixers. Uh, we planted a number of them already at the farm last year and year before. Uh, here, Griffin, uh, our farm's director, planting one of those trees. And here, how trees look like when they are not maintained. So if you don't maintain them, they will, will, they will be branching anywhere. And uh, we just uh, made this uh, first uh, batch of these trees and we probably will start distributing them to the farmers soon. And showing this root to you, what I wanted to show mostly is how long this root. So if I move here, yeah. if you see, this is a small plant. This is a very small plant. And this is, oops, sorry. And this is a how long of a root it makes. So what I'm thinking about prosopis trees, you really have to plant them when they are small. Don't wait for these plants to reach um, 18 uh, inch uh, height. Plant them when they are three or four inch tall, because at this time they already will have a very long root. Actually, I have here a jar. I don't know if you see this. Um, can you see me, um, Ben? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, if you, you can pull see it a little her. more towards your head. Okay. Like this? Yeah. Okay. So this is the same plant I had in my jar. And I hope, because I don't see myself, uh, this is a plant and uh, maybe closer here. And this is now I'm pulling this root. See? 
this is still going, going and going. So this is about a half meter root on this uh, five inch plant. So that's what I'm basically saying here to the growers. Don't wait for these plants to get big. Uh, I mean, big on surface. They already have huge roots and you actually want to plant them early. So you actually will start utilizing this uh, really nice, great root structure, which will go deep down and will be drinking water uh, from very, very low um, uh, low subsoil surfaces. Um, because if you keep this plant in the pot too long, you're basically interfering with the structure, uh, farming structure of this of this root, physical structure of this root. Okay. And of course, this uh, this tree requires very low uh, water input. Uh, low quads. Uh, this is a, a last one uh, from which I'm trying uh, to um, trying to introduce. Uh, and we actually just planted our very first lockwood wind break right here. So we are planting prosopis here, but actually we have both lockwood wind break over here along the road here, and then I have also fijoe wind break. So uh, where am I? Sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm moving wrong direction. Sorry about this. Um, so what we did with Lockwood, we planted actually them very close by. So when Lockwood is planted just one to two uh, foot apart from, uh, they will form a tall and dense hedge. I don't have a picture, but I've seen such a hedge and I really was impressed how well it behaves. So it really will provide a good, good wind protection. If you want to use lockwoods as a shade tree, they can be trimmed the same way as I would trim prosopis, leave a single trunk for six, seven, six, seven foot, and then let it branch. And density of the foliage for lockwood is about the same density as ingam. Um, yeah, and the fruits, as I mentioned, they can be they can be they can be easily sold and distributed. And uh, in my gardening groups, I always see a lot of requests for lockwood fruits when they're in season, and there are no no distributors basically. So yeah, that's basically end of my talk. And um, if you take anything from this meeting, I at least want you to remember uh, these trees, these three species, which will provide a really nice structural foundation for the coffee orchard. And um, some of this we might even have available for our uh, for our farmers. Yep, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Marta. That was a uh... Absolutely fantastic presentation. And um, we're just going to dive into some questions for a little bit. And maybe we'll start with uh, Felipe. And if folks have other questions, you can uh, put them in the box or try to find a moment when there's uh, time to jump in. Um, so Felipe, uh, I wrote down some questions here. You talked a little bit about some of the diseases that you have in Brazil and kind of how you go about um, dealing with them. I was also really kind of wanting to try out some of your SL28 and Wolicho. Do you know anywhere that we can uh, purchase those to taste in the US or abroad? Yeah, Ben, um, those are still in development stage. So okay. you, you have to come down here to try them. Nice. Um, we might get a little bit up. Uh, most, a lot in the, near you, um, someone who's roasting our coffee really well is Andrew Barnett at Linea in San yeah. Francisco. We might be sending a little bit of the uh, experimental lots up to him. I'll let you know. Uh, this will be coming up in the, in the fall. Okay. And, um, but yeah. Um, Near you as well, um, Elliot at Steady State near Carlsbad, Cal uh, California, is roasting some of our coffee. Um, those are some good places to try. Nice. But um, your first question, should I go to that? 
Uh, sure, yeah, if you want to spend a little more time with that. Sure. Well, uh, going back to the disease, to the varieties, um, what I've found, if I give you a little bit of a glimpse, is that um, <clears throat> it's not like my uh, geisha is going to taste like a Panama geisha. So if that's what you want, then um, I'm sad to say that's not going to happen. Um, so, and as a consumer, if you're expecting one thing and you taste something else, it could be a little disappointing. Um, but, you know, what's in the cup is a combination of the genetics, um, the terroir, and what you do on your farm. So, like, if you use some of the shade trees that, you know, Marta was talking to or not, that can kind of change the terroir, the microorganisms. Um, my, like I said, my, my environment is going to uh, really enhance a lot of the sweetness, a lot of the fresh fruit, a lot of the creaminess. And so... Um, the, uh, the SL28 brings a little bit of pop to it, a little bit of uh, acidity to it. Um, but um, I think that some of the Ethiopians have been like uh, really interesting because they, I think Brazil and Ethiopia blend very well together. I've tried it with, with some of my customers, my, my, my customers roasted uh, espresso blends and um, it's almost like the blend is in one bean. Um, you get this really sweetness, creamy, and then you get this like kind of Yergeshefi lemongrass kind of berry punch to it. So um, kind of like, you know, my farm uh, was sort of like the vocation is to be a, a delicious espresso. Uh, this is just like a um, kind of a Ethiopia Brazilian blend in one in one bean. Um, so um and uh, we work with farms in um, four different regions of Brazil. So uh, a lot of times when I'm planting uh, varieties, I'm thinking about replanting them somewhere else, uh, like in Espírito Santo, where it's a little bit more acidic and, and, um, and different things like that. So SL28 probably works somewhere else. Um, with the diseases, again, it depends on your region. Um, but, you know... Um, I would say that leaf rust is always a big one. Um, it's increasingly so in Brazil, um, but we've got some pretty great varieties that are resistant to that. Um, I handle a lot, um, just kind of a, a dry, increasingly dry weather, dry spells. So that's not a disease, but that's, a, that's something to overcome um, and just trying to keep enough humidity in the coffee and soil. Um, Leaf miner is a big one. Um, uh, we call it Bishu Mineiro and we're really close to the state of Minas. So uh, this leaf miner uh, really attacks the leaves and uh, keeps my coffee from growing and growing fresh tissue and, and uh, producing sugar for the, tr for the berries. Um, so those are some of, the, some of the main things that we handle. Um, and um, it's really about monitoring um, just uh, keeping monitoring and then making a decision where whether that variety is too sensitive to continue working or not. Um, so uh, yeah, I think I've saw a couple more questions. Yeah, Ryan. so what, what, are, what are some of the cover crops that you use and do you ever have any trouble with the, it looks like the, you know, the cover crops kind of choking out the young coffee plants if, um, so I think that, um, that's a, that's a great question. We kind of plant the cover crops, uh, in between the rows. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I think they're particularly wonderful for before you plant. Yeah. Um, uh, so before you plant, uh, we, we, we have a, a big mix of, of them. I know the Brazilian, or I should say scientific names, um, but you generally uh, can find someone, um, a consultant that would give you an idea of, um, you know, when you would, when you would plant them, if it's better in the summer or the winter, but we, you know, we use um, different types of um, uh, sunflower, uh, different types of leguminous beans, um, uh, Feijão Guandu is a, is a great one. It's kind of a tall, um, 
uh, bean. It's not to eat, but it pr pr produces like a great uh, windbreaker as well. Um, you know, uh, Crotalaris espectabilis um, and um, uh, black oats in the wintertime. Um, what else? Uh, different types of uh, um, wheat. Um, so um, there's some great study in cover crops uh, and how they can recover soils. Um, uh, we have uh, a, a great consultant that um, his, his name's Dr. Ademir Caligari, and I can send you this later if you want to share with people. He's got some. He's a Brazilian, but he's um, he's got a lot of stuff published in English. Uh, he did a PhD in England on cover crops all over uh, Africa and, and different parts of Asia. Um, how to recover and also increase um, the yields of the plants over time. Um, so I would say that uh, for us, the the what happens is at our tropical climate, the, we have grass that's very, um, uh, the brush, the grass is very strong and that's great for producing organic matter, but it really competes with the, with the coffee plants. The cover crops themselves, um, they don't compete so much with the coffee plant, especially as we plant them in between the rows. Um, so as we uh, plant, get more cover crop seeds and actually they battle the grass, uh, they take the place of the grass. That's actually something we want. Um, but um, in the first years, for sure, like the, the first two or three years is really the expensive part of forming your field. You know, you've got agriculture as long-term investments. You don't really get your production going till the third year. Um, so you got to plant uh, in between the rows. And then what happens is in between the coffee plants, you got to maintain that clean and that's what's really expensive. So that's why I was saying that sometimes a more pragmatic approach um, and even I'm not against, this could sound horrible, but using herbicide once or twice a year in the first year um, to keep your costs down and then transition to organic. I would check with the certifier, the regulations to USDA, how, how that happens, how that works. Um, but you can cut your costs like, you know, 200% from, from um, taking a more pragmatic approach uh, or cut your cost, I would say 80%. So yeah, um, kind of when, yeah. when you're looking at more of the 50 year or 100 year vision as to kind of what you're going to be creating there. Um, yeah, that's, thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, I like the idea of kind of creating a little bit of ecological succession in the orchard. If you know, if you're going to if you have kind of like a year zero where you can introduce a cover crop to, uh, to, to your land, maybe the year before you're going to plant the coffee and just kind of get some biological activity in the soil. Uh, just real quickly, how often do you guys uh, prune and can you talk a little bit about your kind of pruning philosophy with your coffee? Sure. Um, so we are always, um, uh, we call it jizbrotar, which is take out the new shoots, the new, I don't know what you call that in English, uh, the new growth, the new, the new shoots. So you kind of want to keep kind of a Christmas tree ornamental looking coffee plant uh, for us. And um, we do that twice a year, usually, maybe three times, but usually twice a year um, that we go in and we take out the new shoots, try to keep, um, you know, uh, more primary uh, um, uh, di uh, just fluid nutrients going straight to the, um, to the beans and not having to divide with secondary tertiary growth, uh, as that could be a waste of, of nutrients and resources to the plant. So, um, with that pruning is generally keeping that sort of shape going, keeping the plant, um, growing nicely. And, um, uh, so, if everything's going well, then uh, it's kind of a decision of uh, do you want to uh, have more fresh tissue or do you want to have do you want to have more concentration of production or do you want to kind of balance it out over uh, over every year? Um, sometimes people do what we call safra zero, which is zero zero harvest. Um, so they will actually skeleton the plants, uh, you know, one year, every other year, 
um, and that concentrates the production. Um, so you grow one year, the plants grow, and the next year you you don't grow, you don't harvest. So the year you grow, you don't harvest anything, and then you the next year you pick, and so that makes picking uh, much more efficient. Um, so there's different opinions on that, but um, I generally um, depends on the varietal growth. But I will skeleton maybe six or seven years every six or seven years, and then I'll I'll stump. Um, maybe three times throughout the life of the of the uh, variety. Again, depending on of the tree, depending on the variety. Awesome! And, um, Thank you yeah. so much. Really appreciate that. I know we're kind of getting up on the hour. Uh, I wanted to go to Marte real fast. Uh, I was kind of asking, can you just describe germplasm if people aren't really familiar with that term? What is what is that? What does that mean for you? Oh, germplasm is basically a collection of different accessions. So what do we have for any particular, uh, for any particular plant species? So for loquats, while we have relatively large germplasmas in the United States, but it was mostly maintained through the California rare fruit growers to whom I belong. But there is no actual... Um, I don't know, academic or USDA supported collections. So it's mostly through the people and I'm trying to collect now uh, many of them. So there are basically just uh, mostly like a small business, I don't know, hobbyist distributors of material. So that's what's happening. Actually, we planted some loquats already into 1.7 liter pots. We have on the farm. Last month I came, I brought a lot of seedlings. So we will be distributing them hopefully this summer. Oh, that's and, exciting. Yeah, and we can start uh, with seedlings. And, and I actually planted already some of really good cultivars on the farm too, grafted trees. So we will start, yeah, we will start distributing them to the growers, assuming they have interest. So, and any other species I mentioned today, I think Sanjet or any other Eliagnosis has a lot of potential, but we need kind of to check are the growers really interested uh, how how the species actually performs in the orchard because we really don't know yet, right? Until we start, until we start experimenting with it uh, in our orchards. So, right. It's an it's it's only early stages. Do you know if uh, the appeal sciences material could be applied to the loquat fruit, the exterior, to extend its shelf life? I think so. Yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, you would check with appeal, of course, as I yeah. know better, but I always skin my loquats. I don't consume loquat skins. I skin them. Mm -hmm. And that's how they always consume in, in Japan, for example. But I notice here people very often eat them with skins. So I don't know if appeal product can be consumed or not. I think yeah. it can, but I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. um okay so that's not, yeah peel sciences is a company that's based in galita and it's kind of extends the shelf life mm -hmm. of uh, fruit so we use it on some of our other fruits to get a better uh shelf life and it's an organic uh material um so i know that fringe is uh selling ingas and prosorbis and casarenas uh mm -hmm. this year to our growers to kind of help out with um you know, building a little bit, of building diversity and having windbreaks. Um, do you know of other kind of good fruit tree suppliers in Southern and Central California that people could look into or recommend? No, you know, this year, especially this two COVID years, we already in a year and a half of COVID, basically nursery stocks were depleted a lot. Yeah. So there is not much uh, you can easily access now. No, in terms of loquats, uh, no. I Yesterday, when I searched internet for prosopis, I actually found that, yes, in Texas, you can buy some prosopis trees. They even have um, grafted trees, but they are mostly supplied for the landscapers. So they're like in 24 to 36 inch boxes. So it's only for landscaping purposes. That's how, that's how they create uh, these prosopis trees. I don't think you can easily buy any 
any of this in a small format, like a for orchard setting. I think we have to work on all this. Yeah, and for those growers who are watching this video and they're looking to try to find some different fruits, you might, if you're in you know, North County, San Diego, you might reach out to Chuck Badger and, and see where he's able to get some fruits from and, or you can reach out. Yeah, to so via in the end of the loquat season, I think everyone who has access to loquat trees, there are lots of um, stray loquat trees and in California street on California streets just mm -hmm. go and pick some yeah and start planting seeds and uh, we will do what we can I just not sure how many how many we can produce ourselves all right and so one question came in from Brent and that was you know how old or what size are the coffee trees and when they move from the greenhouse uh, to be planted um, so I mean from fringes uh, uh, sales point of view, we, we have plants that are in 1.7 liter sleeves, and we also have plants that are in number five uh, pots, and there are different kind of pricing tiers um, for kind of the amount of uh, trees that you buy, and um, those are two options, and they're generally uh, the 1.7 uh, liter sleeves are getting very close to one year old and the number of five pot trees are getting close to being two years old. Um, sometimes there's some uh, plus or minus in that range, but that's the general from our company. Did, I hope that answered your question, Brent. Uh, we've kind of come up on our hour. I just want to say thank you so much to Felipe and Marta. Those were really fantastic presentations and I'm excited to have these recorded and you know available for our growers to to look at. So with that, I just want to say thank you for your time. And um, if there's nothing else, I'm just going to hit stop for the recording. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Uh